Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can be here this day. Uh, and thank you that we do have uh, this letter to the Thessalonians. Thank you for the incredible witness of their faith. And we pray that by your spirit, you'll help us be people uh, who are talked about in the years to come because of uh, your work in our lives and how you use us uh, to transform this place for your glory. Father, we pray that you'll help us be encouraged, you'll help us hear afresh your word, and you'll help us trust you and live for you all our days. And we speak now what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I wonder uh, if we were to be able to uh, see inside your heart, so to speak, or, or to be with you when you close the doors and are on your knees before your Father in heaven in prayer, what it is that you would be typically praying for. What are the, 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 the default instincts of your prayer life? What are the things that you keep turning to your Father in heaven for in prayer? I suspect that for many of us, our default things very much lay in the here and now, very much lay in terms of thinking about our own needs, our own struggles, and bringing them before God in prayer. Some of us will want to say we at least get beyond ourselves and think of another person. But again, I imagine many of the things we think about are very temporal, very about what's going on right now in my life and needing help with God for that and asking God for help with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, as predictable as it is for me to talk about Anthony Green the night, the day after an election, every time we have a Bible reading where we see the, the prayers in the Bible, we see prayers in the Apostle Paul or prayers of the Lord Jesus, I find myself wanting to pause and take a moment to just try and learn from it. Because one of the, 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 the default setting of the Christian life is we are meant to be people of prayer, but what is it that we should be praying for? What are the things that our God wants us to bring before him in prayer? And one of the simplest ways to learn what it is that we ought to be praying for is to read the prayers of the scriptures. The prayers that, that God by his Holy Spirit has inspired to be written down for us. That's, that's a pretty good starting point. If we want to know what, what sort of prayers please our Father in heaven, turning to the prayers of scripture is a good starting point. Uh, and so this morning, as we continue this series uh, in First Thessalonians, uh, at the end of that, that, that long reading that Cynthia did so well bringing for us, uh, is one of these prayers of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to be encouraged uh, to, to maybe modify our own prayer life to be somewhat more in line with the prayers of Scripture. And here are three things this morning that we're going to see uh, from this prayer of the Apostle Paul that we should be people who pray frequently and earnestly, that we should be praying for overflowing love, and we should be praying to be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. Uh, as we jump in there, uh, there, there is, of course, a whole lot that happened uh, in Chapter 2, in the first half of Chapter 3, that we're going to, I'm going to skim over this morning. We have Christmas coming. I want to be able to finish this before Christmas and say you, you can't say everything. Uh, but what we're missing out on is, is Paul giving us really a bit of the background of what led him to praying this prayer, because he had gone through this separation from the church in Thessalonica. Uh, remember, we, we, we talked last week very briefly about the, the history, but, but Paul was, 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 saw this vision of the man of Macedonia calling him to, to come over to mainland Europe, and he, and he landed in Philippi and planted a church there, and great things happened there, but he also faced great persecution, and he had to leave. And then he went down the road, a couple of days' journey, to Thessalonica. And, and again, some wonderful things happened there, but persecution happened, and he had to leave and, and, and move on. And during this separation, he had this, this incredible anxiety for the church he'd left behind, filled with these new believers, many of them coming from Gentile backgrounds and suddenly having this complete change in their life. And he's worried, where, how are they going in their faith? And so what we see in chapter 2 is, is Paul talks a bit about that background. He talks about how, how he suffered in Philippi, and, and, and yet he still continues to preach the gospel because he knows, uh, you see that, uh, in verse 4, that he is someone who has been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. He then says he's not trying to... And so even though he goes through tremendous suffering, 
he still knows his job is to preach the gospel. Even if the gospel isn't always well received, he still needs to bring it. And so uh, he talks about how he's not trying to please people, but he's pleasing God. He doesn't use flattery. He doesn't do it for greed. He doesn't do it for dishonest gain. But he is looking to praise God. We then see that he has this, this incredibly intimate relationship with the Thessalonians. And it's, the, the next few verses, it's kind of like he has this confusion about what his role of the family is. Because he keeps changing hats. <coughs> see there in verse 7, he describes himself as being like a young child among the Thessalonians in the, in the sense that he was gentle with them. But then he, he describes himself as being like a nursing mother. Uh, like a, a, a mother with child who is still ne needing milk to be fed. So he goes from being a young child to being the mother of the young child in verse 7. Uh, in verse 9, he describes them as brothers and sisters, like he's on equal terms with them. And then a few verses later, in verse 11, he describes himself as being like a father in how he encourages and urges the, the children to live lives worthy of the gospel. <coughs> what we're hearing here is this close family language going on. But he is worried. He's worried the Thessalonians might fall away. And so what he does is he sends uh, his offside of Timothy to go back to Thessalonica and find out what's going on. <coughs> He's worried about, about them, but Timothy goes down the road and eventually, unfortunately, he can't text back to Paul straight away and say, actually, everything's fine here, and the Thessalonians are going great, and they miss you. We have to wait for Timothy to get there, find out what's going on, and then make the journey back. But once he gets back, Paul is just so relieved to hear that all is well with that church. And so it leads him to praying this prayer. <coughs> By the way, if you noticed this morning, I wasn't shaking any hands. There's a reason why. <laughs> well, I went through the afterwards as well. Uh, anyway, let's get right into it there. Uh, verse 9 and 10. Paul says, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. We can see uh, what's going on with the, 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 the prayer life of Paul. There is this frequency and intensity to his prayers. He desperately wanted to visit Thessalonians, but he wasn't able to. But that didn't stop him from pleading with God to change these circumstances. And we're told that he's praying night and day for things to change. The word Paul uses to describe the intensity of his prayer life is it, it, it's, it's emphasising that it's, it's excessive in the nature of his prayers. He's talking about an abundance of prayer. One commentator describes it. It's like Paul is trying to flood heaven with his pleas. He's just earnest, desperate in prayer. It, it reminds me of the story in Luke chapter 18 of the persistent widow. Uh, you know the story of the widow who wanted justice but the local town judge was someone who didn't fear God, didn't fear people, and he just kept saying, no, 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 don't care, not listening. But the widow kept asking, the widow kept asking, the widow kept asking, and eventually the judge just relented. He said, I don't fear God, I don't fear people, but this woman just won't keep, stop harassing me. So I'll grant her justice. And, and, and Jesus is saying, well, is that what our prayer life will be like? And in a sense, Paul is like that widow. He is just praying and praying and praying and praying and flooding heaven with his pleas. Friends, I don't know about you, but I find this challenging. Night and day is, is challenging enough. <coughs> but it's the intensity and the devotion to, to the cause that really hits me. Now, this isn't like the job interview where you're asked, what's your biggest weakness? And you say, oh, I'm too much of a hard worker. Or I'm too devoted. No, no, Paul is being genuine here. He's just saying, I am a tireless, hard-working, devoted prayer warrior for this church. And so it's a challenge for us. Do we have this tireless attitude in our own prayer lives? 
Do we have this tireless attitude in praying for one another? What would it look like for us to be most earnest in prayer? I find this especially challenging for me as your minister because one of, if not my primary responsibility for you all, is to pray for you. To continually, earnestly intercede for you in prayer. But it should be a challenge for us all. Who is it in your life that God has entrusted you with? Who are the people that God has entrusted to your care? Who are the people you're trying to reach with the good news? Remember last week we spoke about that we ought to have, you know, well, let's say three people in our lives that we are continually praying for, praying that we might have opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with. Are we earnestly praying for those people? Are we earnestly praying for opportunities? For those of you who have, who have others, though, that maybe are, are new believers that you have influence over. Are you praying that they will continue in the faith like Paul prays for the Thessalonians? For those of you who, who, who might be leading our kids' church, are you praying for the kids that you're down there with, praying for them to continue with trusting in Jesus? For those who might be leading a youth group, are you praying for those youth that they will continue trusting in Jesus? For those of you who have you know, family members, are, are you praying for them to continue trusting in Jesus? Friends, if we want to see this church grow, then we need to commit to pleading with God that he would use us to grow his kingdom here in Circular Head and daily, continually, earnestly, intensely ask our God to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. That's how we're going to see things grow here in Circular Head. Next thing we're going to see is that we should pray for overflowing love. Verse 11 and 12, Paul prays, get myself tangled here. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you also. Paul's prayer for this church is that their, their love would increase and overflow for each other and for the world around them. Uh, I think sometimes when you hear that someone's going to uh, pray for person X about an issue, it's because person X is pretty hopeless at this thing. Uh, for example, you, you all know that member in your family, that family member of yours, who as their birthday approaches, they continually remind you that it's coming. Six weeks until my birthday, three weeks until my birthday, five sleeps until my birthday, three days, six hours, 13 minutes until my birthday. I can't wait for my birthday. I can't wait for the presents you're going to get me. And they look like they are losing their minds in this eager expectation of their special day. By the way, right now, if you can't think of that person in your family, you are that person. And what do you say to that person? You might say to them, I'll pray for patience for you. And sure, on one hand, you're asking God to genuinely help them learn how to be patient, but you're doing so because they're hopeless. They're the most impatient person you know. But the thing is, with the Thessalonians, that's actually not the case. He doesn't pray for them to have love that increases and overflows because they are full of hatred and animosity for each other. Actually, these are the superstars at loving each other. Multiple times throughout this letter, Paul pretty much begins the letter by talking about their, their, their love. In chapter 4, he, he talks about that. We actually, we don't need to write about love for you guys because you guys have already been taught by God how to love each other. You're, like, you're, you're the superstars at this. And what Paul is acknowledging is that there is one aspect of the Christian life you can never have enough of. And so here... He doesn't pray that God will give them love as if they don't have any to start with, but their love would increase and their love would overflow because you can never have enough love. Uh, I've been pondering, and I, I, I've been pondering this for years and never get anywhere, uh, but, but, but this idea of love that increases and love that overflows, what is a concrete example of what this might look like? The problem is, about every concrete example I think of is a negative of something that increases so much that it overflows. Think of the river or the dam. And as the water level rises, the water level rises and it overflows, 
Well, it causes destruction, doesn't it? So you, you probably don't want that to be the thing you think of for this. Or think of a volcano that the activity increases so much that it begins to overflow and the lava spills over. And again, not an ideal situation to be part of if you're part of the overflow. A less destructive version uh, is when we have a cup and we fill it with too much liquid and as the liquid increases, it overflows. Not particularly destructive, but a pain to clean up nonetheless. Uh, and some would cry, uh, you know, of course, spilt milk. Maybe not worth crying about, but maybe it is. It's pretty annoying. There might be a better example, but the only example I ever come up with on this is one that I have used before with you guys in a slightly different context, but you know what? You can hear it twice. You see, a few months back, I think I was talking about the lavishness of God's grace, and it reminded me of something very important. Uh, it reminded me of the fact that I am not a cake eater. I've never been a big fan of cakes. My mother is here this morning. You can ask her and she will confirm that I was never a cake eater growing up, although don't ask her too much about my dietary habits because she'll then tell you all the, the bad habits I also had as well. But, but if you were going to get me to eat cake, then there is a key criteria. Now, before I continue, I know that there is a handful of ladies in this room that know what I'm going to say is, isn't entirely true because they saw me eat a sponge cake during the week. And I really enjoyed it. And I want to suggest that's the exception that proves the rule. Because the rule is, if you're going to get me to eat a cake, then it needs to have icing on top of this cake. And not just a smooth layer on top, a little one millimetre thick layer on top that is neat and tidy. It needs to be overflowing icing. It needs to be oozing down each side of the cake. It needs to be a puddle of icing at the bottom. It needs to be the point that, that, that when you look and you've still got that, you know, wherever you made your icing in the little container and there's some icing left, you should think, no, there shouldn't be any icing left there. It should be poured all over the cake. When you get a cake and it has icing that overflows, you know it is something really good. And I want to suggest every time you are a, a, a glorious beneficiary of such a cake, remember that it's meant to symbolise love. A few months ago I said it's meant to remind us of God's grace to us. Remember that too. But remember also it's meant to symbolise love. That our love for one another and for everyone else is meant to be a love that overflows like thick oozing icing on a delicious moist cake. Friends, imagine what things would look like if we pray this. Imagine what things might look like if we are a people who are known for our, our overflowing love for one another, our overflowing, ever-increasing love and generosity. Uh, Don Carson, who's a New Testament uh, scholar and just uh, just written about a million books, if you've ever seen a book by Don Carson or D.A. Carson, it's worth getting your hands on it. And he describes this scene like this. He describes what it meant to look like. He says, when this love is described, this displayed, this overflowing love, it speaks volumes to our society that gorges itself in self-interest. It speaks volumes to our society that, 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 that gorges itself in self-interest, lust, and mutual admiration packs, whilst it knows very little of love. Show me a church where the choir is known as the war department. Show me a church where people divide over evangelistic strategies. Show me a church where people divide over the colour of the carpet. And I'll show you a church that has not been praying along these lines of overflowing love for one another for a long time. Conversely, we will see profound spiritual reformation if by God's grace we make it our commitment to not put anyone down except on our prayer list. We want to be people who are praying for overflowing, ever-increasing, oozing love for one another. Uh, we often talk about that 
Uh, we live in an age where, where church attendance has become less frequent, not, not only as a fewer people in wider society uh, go to church, but even the, the people who say they are part of the church have just become less frequent for whatever reason. We've gone from, from thinking every week is the standard, or at least three times, to maybe a couple of times a month, or once a month. Or there's, there, is, there was one survey done that said people felt I was a regular church attender if they came once every six weeks or so. Now, there's a whole heap of reasons why I think this is this has taken place, and I was reminded by driving this morning, as I saw now there's a hardware store open in town on a Sunday morning, that there, there are things like, there are ever-increasing distractions for us. But I think one of the reasons why this happens is we, we fall for this temptation to think, well, I make sure I'm there when I'm on something. So if we are on the roster, then we make sure we turn up. But if we're not on the roster that week, then it doesn't really matter. In fact, for some of us, the reason why we want to avoid getting on a roster is because we want to avoid feeling like we're committed to having to be there at certain times. Friends, can I suggest that if you are part of this church, then you are down on the roster every single week for at least two things. You are rostered on to pray. You are rostered on to pray for overflowing love. Pray that we would show overflowing love. Pray that this church be a place of overflowing love. Pray that this would be a church that, that a place where, where people will know that we are the disciples of the Lord Jesus because of our love for one another. And of course, you're rostered on for a second thing, aren't you? You're not just rostered on to pray that there would be love. You're rostered on to be the one who shows overflowing love. And God willing, be the recipient of overflowing love as well. Sometimes we think it doesn't matter if we don't turn up because we won't really be missed. And hey, if I'm not rostered onto something, then, I'm, then, then no one's missing out on me doing my bit. But actually, when you're not here, we are all poorer for it. We're poorer for it because we can't be the beneficiaries of your overflowing love for us. And we're also poorer for it because we can't then in turn show you that overflowing love. Last thing this morning is that we want to be people who pray to be ready for the return. Paul finishes his prayer, this prayer that, that, is, that is earnest and frequent, this prayer of love that overflows by asking God, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his Holy ones. This is what we're meant to have in mind when we come before God in prayer. When we pray for ourselves and when we pray for those that God has entrusted to us. What is most important for that person? What will be most beneficial for that person? Because if we listen to our typical prayers, we might pray for the temporal matter, we, we, we pray for work. We might pray for students for their upcoming exams. We might pray for their happiness. We might pray for their health. We might pray for their well-being. Now, it's not wrong to do that, but there's something more important. There's something more beneficial that we can be praying. We want to pray that they will be ready. We want to pray that they will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God the Father when the Lord Jesus does return. We want to pray for people to be ready for the day. We want to pray that because what are we going to be found doing on that day? Do we want to be found being selfish or be found in self-sacrificial love? Do we want to be found caring for ourselves or caring for the other? That's what we're praying for, overflowing love, isn't it? praying that, that, we, that we do those things so that we'll be found being people of love on the day when the Lord Jesus returns. And this isn't just something that Paul does. This is something that we actually pray every single week. Some of us pray every single day in our own devotional life. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. And yes, part of your kingdom come is wanting to see it happen right here, right now. We want to see, 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 see God being glorified now. We want to see the, the, the goodness of his kingdom lived out now. We want to see lives transformed now. But it's ultimately a prayer for the end. It's a prayer, Lord Jesus, return. Lord Jesus, bring about the, the fullness of your kingdom, of your everlasting reign. And so this should trigger our hearts and our minds. If we're praying your kingdom come, am I desiring in my own life? Am I praying for myself? Am I praying for others in light of the coming kingdom of God? Am I praying prayers in light of eternity? Am I praying for holiness? Am I praying for readiness? Am I praying for things that in 10,000 years' time will matter? It changes our perspective on prayer, doesn't it? It makes us want to pray for the things that really will, in the end, count. Friends, we finish up, and I think my voice is about to call it quits. I hope we've been reminded that we are a people of prayer. We want to see God at work in our world, we want to see God at work in our church. We want to see God being glorified. We need to pray and pray and pray some more. If we earnestly want to see this, 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 this more and more lives transformed with the good news of Jesus, we want to see this church, we want to see all the churches that circulate overflowing with, with people and overflowing with love, then we need to pray and pray and pray some more. Can I encourage you to pray earnestly for those people in your life that God has entrusted to you? Be praying that they would have love. Be praying that they have love that overflows. Be praying in light of eternity. Because, yeah, sure, you'd love for them to be happy and healthy and wealthy right here, right now. But in the end, those things would be rather meaningless if they're not ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. So be praying prayers in light of the fact that the day that the Lord Jesus will come is coming. Pray prayers that will matter in eternity. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. We ask that by your spirit you will help our love overflow. May it increase each day. May we be known for our generous love. May we see the person in the, in the next seat as someone that we can show love for. Not just be civil with one another. Help us be people who love and care and show compassion. And help us be people who want everyone that we know to be ready for the day. So we pray that by your spirit you'll help us pray prayers in light of the day that is coming. In the name of the one who will return. In his glorious name we pray. Amen.